Let's start by agreeing on an important point. Could the ancient Gaelic-speaking Celts have reached the Americas before the Vikings and Columbus? Absolutely, they could have. Thanks in large part to the robustness of the Curra, a boat originating on ancient Ireland's western coast that's made by stretching animal hide over a wooden frame. Outfit such a vessel with a couple of timber masts harvested from an Irish forest and you could sail from Ireland to Newfoundland in, say, just over a year. Which is exactly what writer-slash-adventurer Tim Severin and crew did back in the 1970s. Severin was attempting to recreate the voyage of Brendan the Navigator, a historical Irish saint born in the year 484 CE. Now, the story of Brendan's voyage, which was first recorded in Latin perhaps as early as the 8th century CE, is widely considered to be legendary. Indeed, there are clear parallels between it and an earlier Irish story, the voyage of Male Dune. In both voyages, the protagonists explore an island full of bird spirits, spirit birds, and they encounter giant crystal columns, and they sail across a translucent sea and go to an island full of giant smiths. Of course, Christian scribes lifting the cool bits from pagan lore and ascribing them to the lives of Irish saints is nothing new, and on its own, doesn't necessarily negate the idea that the historical Brendan went on an actual, non-fantastical journey across the sea sometime in the 6th century. After all, the story of Viking Thorfinn Karlsefni's transatlantic voyage, as detailed in the 13th century Vinland sagas, was once thought to be legendary, and has since been proven true. Or rather, it was proven that a similar voyage took place. In 1960, archaeologist Anne Stein Ingstad and her explorer husband Helga Ingstad discovered the remains of an encampment at Lance O Meadow in Newfoundland, an encampment that would be dated through tree ring analysis and radiocarbon dating estimates to around the year 1000 CE. In addition to identifying the footprints of eight wood-framed sod buildings, the husband and wife team uncovered several everyday items used by Norsemen and Norse women of that era, including an oil lamp, a bronze pin, a bone knitting needle, and a part of a spindle. It is through the confluence of all of these data and discoveries one can conclude with a high degree of certainty that Norse Vikings beat Christopher Columbus and co. to the already inhabited New World. This was, and still is, huge news. History books rewritten. But do the history books need to be rewritten again? Because if the History Channel, that bastion of academic integrity, is to be believed, the ancient Celts reached the Americas first. But let's back up a bit, because two decades before the dawn of the so-called History Channel, there was Barry Fell in his 1976 book, America BC, Ancient Settlers in the New World. A confession. I found a copy of Barry Fell's America BC at a now defunct used bookstore in Montreal sometime in the late 2000s. At the time, as a young, impressionable humanistic studies major who played Irish and Scottish folk music at the local pubs and occasionally at that very bookstore, I was enthralled. At first glance, the book reads like an academic work, something rooted in sound science. Fell purported that between the 8th and 6th centuries BCE, the Celtiberians, the Celts of the Iberian Peninsula, which is now now Portugal and Spain, migrated to North America, settling primarily in New England. He backed up this claim with two main pieces of evidence, which I will address in turn. Firstly, Fell argued that many stones and monoliths in New England are rife with ancient Ogham inscriptions, Ogham being the hash mark-like system of writing allegedly employed by the Celtiberians. And here we've already run into a problem because while Fell claimed to have discovered Ogham inscriptions both in Iberia and New England, which date back to around the 8th century BCE, Ogham itself would not be invented until the 5th century CE in southwestern Ireland. There's also that pesky problem that when one goes searching for Ogham, any carving with lines in it starts to look like Ogham. And according to Irish scholar and professor Jerry MacOwn, this is precisely the trap into which fell, uh, fell. Quote, the rock scratchings resemble Ogham script only insofar as they are lines on rocks. Dr. Fell ignores completely the question of Celtic history, end quote. Fell's second piece of evidence for a transatlantic ancient Celts stems from the idea that one can find Celtic loanwords in the language of the Algonquins. He assumed, not unwisely, that the ancient Celtiberians spoke a Goidelic, aka Gaelic, version of the Celtic language, and historians agree that this was likely the case, with Brythonic or Britonic Celtic arriving in Iberia in later centuries. But where Fell faltered was in his assumption that the Celtic languages remained static for thousands of years. 
Jones, because in his attempts to translate the quote-unquote Ogham he discovered in New England, he used modern Scots Gaelic as his cipher. This wasn't the best idea. Here, I'll let historian Peter Beresford Ellis explain. Quote, to illustrate the pitfalls, take the word Kuya, which Professor Fell claims was borrowed from the Celts into the Algonquin Indian language to survive today, its meaning being a gorge. He correctly points out that Kuya in modern Scottish Gaelic means a pit. But the word Kuya is in fact a loan word from the Latin into Old Irish coming from the word Putius. This would put its appearance in Old Irish, the progenitor of Scottish Gaelic, not much before the 5th or 6th centuries AD. How then could it have existed in the Celtic of Professor Fell's intrepid explorers of the 8th century BC?" End quote. Here's another question. How could such an educated and presumably smart person, a person with a PhD, a Harvard professor no less, make such a rookie mistake? Well, things might become a bit more clear once you learn that Fell was not a professor of history or linguistics or archaeology. He was a professor of zoology who specialized in marine biology. Despite Fell's work being widely debunked in the years following the publication of America BC, its influence persists, and there has since been a succession of researchers who've taken up the ancient Celts in America torch. One such torchbearer was Richard Thornton, who argued that the Duhair, a pre-Columbian tribe based in what is now the Carolinas and Georgia, were descendants of the Irish O'Hare clan, a clan first mentioned by name, as far as I can tell, in the Annals of Innisfallen, which were compiled in 1092 CE. As the theory goes, the people of Duhair were notoriously tall, white-skinned, red or blonde-haired, and heavily tattooed. I mean, sure, those sound like ancient Gaelic speakers to me. And then there are the possible etymological connections. In addition to arguing that Duhair was rooted in the aforementioned Irish clan name O'Hare, Thornton pointed to the king of the Duhair, known as Daha, and argued that his name was rooted in the Gaelic Daha, meaning dyed or painted. One only need review the testimony of Francisco de Chicora, published by court chronicler Pete Martyr de Gary in his 16th century work De Orb Novo, Decades of the New World, to learn the truth about this Celtic American tribe. Only when you do, you might be surprised to discover that it's in Latin, which means Duhair is an Anglicization. In the original Latin, the place name In Provincia Duhare was given, implying the name in the nominative form would have been Duhara. The name is also later spelled D-U-H-R-H-E, Duharhe, and as journalist slash anthropologist Jason Calvito explains, quote, if we pronounce the name according to Latin rules, du a -re, or assuming the word form was delivered in the Spanish explorer's own language, historical pronunciation, du ha -re, the similarities to the Gaelic fade, end quote. But that's not the only one of Thornton's theories that fades under scrutiny. For example, in the text, the skin of the Duhare or Duhare tribespeople is described as being candidos, meaning pale, light-colored, or bright, and not albus, the usual word for white. And that's because Francisco de Chicora, whose testimony forms the basis of this theory, was himself a Native American from a nearby tribe, the Chicora, and he was describing the appearance of the Duhare in relative terms, i.e. he wasn't saying they were white, just that they had lighter skin than his own tribe. As for the Duhari having, quote, hair like the sun, as I so often see it described on the internet, that's nowhere in the original text. Quote, their hair is brown and hangs to their heels, end quote, is the only passage I could find on Duhare hair color. Oh, and their king, the Daha of Duhare? According to linguist Blair Rudes, the Duhare were members of the Iroquoian Tuscarora tribe, making it more likely that the name Daha corresponds to the old Tuscaroran word for king, Tiha, rather than the Gaelic word for painted. To clarify, I don't think Thornton or Fell, for that matter, are necessarily bad actors keen on duping people. Although a few years back, Thornton did claim he gleaned some secret knowledge from the Lambeth Palace box of lost colonial texts. The only thing is, the texts in question were never lost. People have been studying them for decades. As I touched on earlier, the underlying problem here is that when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. I.e., when you're constantly in search of ancient evidence that will upend the status quo, everything starts to look like ancient evidence that will upend the status quo. And no one demonstrates this fallacy more perfectly than geologist Scott Walter, host of the show America Unearthed, a show that featured Thornton on the pilot episode. Flash forward a few episodes and Walter is exploring the Anubis Caves in Oklahoma where he identifies a carving of a horned animal as an apis bull, sacred to the ancient Egyptians. 
Only, is that really a bull? Or considering it's in Oklahoma, doesn't it make a lot more sense that that's a bison? But since it's identified as a bull, a nearby figure is then dubiously identified as a Persian god famous for sacrificing a bull, Mithras, even though Mithras and Mithraism have nothing to do with the Apis bull or the ancient Egyptian religion, they're two completely separate traditions. What's more, and as pointed out by the Rock Art blog, the figure could be anyone as it's missing telltale Mithras identity identifiers like a dagger or blade. I bring all of this up because at the end of the episode, Walter examines a site nearby and you'll never guess what he finds. Ogham writing from Ireland. So in one episode, Walter finds evidence of not one, not two, but three ancient cultures traversing the Atlantic before the Vikings. Hmm. This is the same guy, mind you, who would go on to announce the discovery of texts containing secrets about Oak Island in the Knights Templar, only to reveal a photo of a mass-produced leather journal that anyone can buy on Amazon. Now, at this point, there is always a small contingent of people tempted to argue, well, you still can't prove that the ancient Celts didn't get to the Americas, to which I'd counter, Shouldn't the burden of proof be on the people seeking to rewrite the history books? As the late great Carl Sagan once said, quote, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, end quote. Archaeologist Anne Stein Ingstad and her husband Helga Ingstad found that kind of extraordinary evidence at Lanso Meadow in Newfoundland, proving beyond a reasonable doubt the Vikings reached the Americas before Columbus. Remember, the Ingstads found the footprints of eight wood-framed sod buildings, an oil lamp, a bronze pin, a bone knitting needle, and part of a spindle, and then through tree ring analysis and radiocarbon dating estimates, the site itself was dated to around 1000 CE. That's how we were able to conclude the Norse reached North America. As for the ancient Celts, nothing even approaching that level of evidence has been discovered. But believe me, as a person running a website and YouTube channel dedicated to exploring Irish mythology and adjacent topics, like the goings-on of the ancient Gaelic-speaking Celts, I would love nothing more than to report that we have definitive proof of ancient Celts in the Americas. So if you think you've found that kind of proof, tell me about it. Leave a comment and let's put it to the sniff test. And if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. That really, really helps. And if you want to learn more about the ancient Celts, hop on over to irishmyths.com where you'll find helpful articles with titles including Who Were the Ancient Celts? and Where Did Celtic Culture Originate? You might also be interested in my earlier video, Differences Between Irish and Celtic Mythology, in which I break down the, well, you get it. As always, my name is I.E. Neverday, editor of the short story collection Neon Druid and creator of irishmyths.com. Thanks for coming up.